Welcome to the third module of generating spatially variant lattices. In the last module, we learned all about generating two-dimensional spatially variant lattices. We're going to generalize that in this one and use what we've done there to spatially vary arbitrary two-dimensional and three-dimensional lattices that are described by a more complicated unit cell than just a straight line of the planar grating. Before we get to the algorithm, we need to discuss two preliminary topics. First is this whole concept of decomposing a lattice into planar grating. So we want to put some math to that and put some pictures to that. The other thing we need to talk about is something called rotation matrices. And when we were talking about spatially varying gratings, we had this theta function that controlled the orientation of the planar grating within the plane that we were talking about. Well, suddenly with a three-dimensional lattice, we can be spatially varying the orientation in all three directions now. So it's sort of like we have a theta and a phi, not the grating phase phi, but azimuth elevation. And a more robust way to handle this, I think, is using rotation matrices instead of any kind of theta map. Armed with that, then we can go in and talk about the algorithm for spatially varying arbitrary lattices. And then after that, we can cover two, I guess, bonus topics, but how to improve the efficiency of the algorithm, make it run a lot faster. And this is also something we'll do in the code when we get to the computer sessions. And then just some final tips and tricks. Okay, our first topic is the Fourier decomposition of lattices, where we'll take an, a unit cell and then through a Fourier transform, decompose that into a set of planar gratings. First, let's recall the math of Fourier series, in particular the complex Fourier series. So what I've done here is I summarized the complex Fourier series for one-dimensional problems, two-dimensional problems, and three-dimensional problems. In this set of slides, we will focus almost exclusively on the two-dimensional. And having done that, the extension to three dimensions should be more clear and obvious. But the main equation that we'll be working with is this middle left-hand side equation where we decompose some function f of x, y into a bunch of complex exponential terms. So let's start with this. That's the equation identified on the previous slide. This is the equation for a complex Fourier series. The original function, f of x, y, this would be, for example, what describes our unit cell. We could plot this and see a nice picture of our unit cell. Then we decompose it into a complex Fourier series, and we have these complex exponentials, a lot of times called the kernel of the transform. And then we have these constant weights and these are the Fourier coefficients. Now if we look at the argument of the complex exponential, we see terms in there that look very much like how grading vectors are defined. For example, we have 2 pi divided by a period. And then it's also multiplying x. We have a 2 pi divided by a period multiplying a y. This is sort of looking like a k dot r. But we have these integers p and q in there. So let's take this 2 pi px over lambda x, sorry, not the x, just 2 pi p over lambda x. And let's call that the x component of our grading vector for some integer index combination p, q. And then this 2 pi q over lambda y we'll call the y component of a grading vector. This lets us interpret what's up here in the argument of the complex exponential as a grating vector. So what does this look like? We have a double summation. So we are summing terms that could be distributed it out across some kind of Fourier space grid this way. And if I were to plot indices p and q, and calculate my grading vector components this way, they would fill a grid that looks something like this, where the blue arrows are the grading vector corresponding to each 
PQ term in that Fourier series expansion. So now, recognizing that 2 pi p over lambda x we'll call kx, and 2 pi q over lambda y we'll call ky, that lets us write our Fourier series expansion this way. And now we see something that looks quite familiar, a complex exponential e to the j k dot r. And if we looked at the real part of that, that is cosine of k dot r, which we've seen before. So this is the beginnings of what tells us we have an, we, we expanded our unit cell into a set of planar gratings, but let's not be convinced of that yet, and let's do more work. So here we are at the Fourier series expansion equation again, and what we want to do is look at the individual terms and plot them and see what they look like. So we have our original f of xy, that is the original unit cell. And then we expand it into the complex Fourier series. When we use, for example, in MATLAB, the built-in FFT2 command, which does a two-dimensional Fourier series expansion, we will do that on our f of xy. And we'll get data that looks something like this. Each one of these pixels, if you will, in this image is one of our APQ. These are the Fourier series coefficients, if you will. And they look something like that. Normally they're concentrated near the center, near the zero order mode, and they decay very quickly. Let's keep looking. Now, let's plot just the complex exponential for each combination of P and Q. And what we see and what we expected from our previous set of slides, these are planar gratings. If you could imagine printing these planar gratings in black and white on transparent film, we could stack those on top of each other, and if we could look through that entire stack of films, we would see that triangular unit cell. That might be a neat experiment to do. Well, really, we also need to look at those planar gratings described by the complex exponential times the Fourier series coefficient. Those planar gratings are weighted in some way. Some of those planar gratings are less significant than others. For example, this particular planar grating is very significant. It goes from black to white, so very high amplitude planar grating. However, this planar grating is not very significant. And you can imagine going even farther away in P and Q, and the planar gratings becoming even less significant. So not even really knowing that these were planar gratings, we could take each term and plot it and see that really our function has been decomposed into a set of planar gratings. Here's another picture I like to draw to visualize this. If we add up all of these planar gratings after they've been weighted by the Fourier series coefficients, we would get our original unit cell back. Now we'll study this a little bit further, but what we'll see is if we only retain a limited set of these planar gratings, we get our original unit cell back, but it's a little bit distorted. When we get to the algorithm and we're actually implementing it, we'll find out when we do this Fourier expansion, there's two parts and two things we have to do. One, I guess we could even say that there's three things. The first thing, building the unit cell, and then we will call the FFT2 command. That will give us the Fourier series coefficients. So these Fourier series coefficients is the first part of the Fourier series expansion, and we get that with a two-dimensional FFT. So that's one line of code in MATLAB. The other part are the grading vectors associated with each term in the complex Fourier series. So if we look at one of the weights, that corresponds to a grading vector over here. And it's a one-to-one it's a -one -one relationship. So each term in the Fourier series expansion has a single grading vector and a, a single Fourier series coefficient. And so there's two parts. The complex Fourier series coefficients we get from the FFT, the grading vectors we calculate analytically, and that just comes from the math of this Fourier series expansion. So those are the two parts to this decomposition. The FFT gives us the weights, or that APQ, 
and the analytical equation gives us our grading vectors for each term in that expansion. What will this actually look like? Well, if you're in MATLAB and you build a triangular unit cell, for example, we'll see something like that. When we FFT that, we will see something like this, and it looks like nothing. But if we look at the very center and zoom in on that, we see that's where the Fourier coefficients are the most significant. It makes sense then, let's not retain all of those Fourier series coefficients. Let's just contain some window centered around PQ equals zero. And by the way, the, the, looking at it this way also leads later on to a better way to truncate which of these terms we retain in our expansion. So we can get away with very few. It takes time to spatially vary each one of these, so the fewer planar gratings we retain, the more efficient our algorithm is. On this slide, we're talking about the consequences of only retaining so many terms in that Fourier series expansion. So on the left is our original unit cell, and if we FFT that, and then retain only a window of that FFT that's one by one. So we're retaining a single pixel, and we inverse FFT that, we get just the DC value. And that's what we'd expect from just the DC component of the Fourier series. And then, so on the left would be our analog lattice, and then on the right would be our binary lattice calculated from the analog lattice. So this is just retaining one term. If we retained a window that was three by three, so nine planar gratings total, we get an analog unit cell that looks like this. And if we use a threshold operation, we get a flat egg looking thing. Anyway, we can see as we, re as we retain more and more planar gratings in the expansion, our unit cell approaches more and more that of a triangle. By the time we get to about 31 by 31, that looks pretty much like the original triangle. Now when we retain more, our spatially variant algorithm will take a lot longer to run. So it's really up to you to figure out how much of a triangle is good enough for your application and try to get away with as few of these terms in the Fourier series as possible. What might this look like in three dimensions? Well, it's a pretty easy extension. Kx and Ky are calculated the same way, but now we have a Kz and another integer r. So we have integers p, q, r. And this is distributed over a three-dimensional Fourier space grid. And what I've done, each one of these blocks here is the same size as our unit cell. And I've shown the planar grading inside each one. And the planar gradings have also been weighted according to the Fourier series coefficients. So it gives you a little bit of a taste of what this looks like in three dimensions. And just like in two dimensions, if we were generating a spatially variant lattice, we would take each one of these planar gratings, spatially varied all on its own, add up all of those individual spatially variant gratings, and put them together to get the spatially variant lattice. Okay, our next preliminary topic is rotation matrices. And we'll use this when we spatially vary a three-dimensional lattice in three dimensions. So what is a rotation matrix? So we start off with a vector A. So imagine we want to rotate this about the axis that's coming out of the screen. So we're rotating within the plane by some angle phi so that we get to vector b. If we're only doing a rotation, the magnitude of b should equal the magnitude of a. It should just be in a different direction. It turns out we can construct a matrix here. In two dimensions, this would be a two by two matrix. In three dimensions, it would be three by three. But we can come up with a matrix with the phi information built into it such that we can multiply, pre-multiply a to get B. Now, since it doesn't change the magnitude, this rotation matrix has some useful properties, and it, it's what is called unitary. So magnitudes are equal. It's Hermitian, which is the complex transpose, is the same thing as its inverse. And if we take the rotation matrix, 
multiply by the Hermitian transpose or complex transpose. We're essentially multiplying R by its inverse and we get the identity matrix. So sometimes those are useful. The most important one there in my mind is that the magnitude of A and B are equal. They're just in a different direction. And the rotation matrix does that. So what does the rotation matrix look like? Well, in two dimensions, we have X and Y components. It is, I think, beyond the scope of these slides to derive this, but I do talk about this in other courses. But here's the answer, and this is all over Wikipedia and um, a bunch of other internet sites. But here's what that matrix would look like. We have a cosine phi in the first element, negative sine phi, sine phi, cosine phi. And this two by two matrix for two dimensions is what we would call our rotation matrix. And it turns out that's really all we need to do this in three dimensions. We really just take those four matrix elements and distribute them in a three by three matrix. Let's look at that next. In Cartesian coordinates, there are three axes that we can rotate about. And here's the best illustration I can come up with of doing that. We can rotate about the x-axis, and here we're always rotating from A into B. So phi is going, in this case, in sort of the clockwise direction. And here is our three by three rotation matrix that does that. Notice we have these same terms that we saw on the previous slide. They're just distributed around that three by three matrix. So in this case, it doesn't do anything to the x-axis. We're rotating about the x-axis. So we're rotating in the yz plane, if you will. Next, we could rotate about the y-axis. And we're rotating A to B. So we're rotating in, in this direction, going into the screen, if you will. And so we do this by angle phi. Here is our rotation matrix for rotating about the y-axis. And similarly, here's the rotation matrix for rotating about the z-axis. And we're, we're rotating from A to B. So we're rotating within the xy plane. So those are our rotation matrices that we'll use. Another thing we can do, rather than just do one rotation, suppose we want to rotate about the x-axis by 10 degrees, and then about the y-axis by 60 degrees, and then about the z-axis by 290 degrees. We could take those individual rotation matrices, multiply them together, and by the way, the one that comes first here on the right, that will be the first rotation, second rotation, third rotation. And we can calculate a single composite rotation matrix, such that if we took this composite rotation matrix multiplied by A, we would get B. But B is as if we've done all of these at the same time or individually. So we can form these composite rotation matrices rather than have to store the X, Y, Z, and, and also remember what order we did them in. We can just calculate one composite one and be done with it. We are now ready and armed with everything to talk about the algorithm for generating arbitrary spatially variant lattices. The first step in this is to generate all of the different input arguments that we'll need. And this is pretty typical. One, we'll have our unit cell. Notice if we look at this unit cell, there's something a little bit different about it. It's not just a black and white triangle. There's a little bit of grayscale happening there. It's actually best to create unit cells that are grayscale in this manner if in the end we want to change the fill fraction. Because if we start with a binary unit cell, we will end with a binary looking unit cell and we'll have very little control using that threshold parameter to adjust fill fraction. So I like to start with a grayscale unit cell and that gives us full control over how big we want those triangles if we want to spatially vary it. Okay, so that's the first one, the unit cell, and we usually prefer a grayscale unit cell. We also need to tell the program how big our lattice will be. Maybe it's 10 by 10 by 10 unit cells, maybe larger, maybe smaller. So we need the lattice size. We will need the information about the orientation of the unit cells. In our prior lecture, that was the theta function, and we can still use that if we're spatially varying only in two dimensions, 
When we move to three dimensions, I find it a little bit better to describe the orientation in terms of the rotation matrices. But whatever that looks like, we need that, and that is an input argument. We also want a map of how we want to spatially vary the lattice spacing. Maybe we want to bloat the unit cells in the middle and leave them at their normal size near the edges. Maybe we also want to taper fill fraction. And there could be many other input parameters. Maybe we want to change the material composition, actually functionally grade permittivity. Maybe we want to chirp the lattice symmetry. So there's a whole bunch of other things and we need to create pictures of how we want to spatially vary these. We don't need equations, we just need pictures. So here's an example creating a, a grayscale unit cell. And notice we're taking the grayscale all the way out to the edges here. And if we spatially vary this, and we'll stick with our, our neat little rainbow pattern, we'd get a lattice that looks something like this, which looks crazy, and sometimes you could look at that and not even know if it's correct or not. But if we have this grayscale unit cell, now we can go in and change the size of the triangles. We can control the fill fraction very easily. As I mentioned before, if we started off with just a binary unit cell, after spatially varying, even our analog lattice would look much more like this binary lattice and the threshold would have almost no effect on that. We would not be able to spatially vary fill fraction. Once we have our unit cell and all the input parameters, the first thing we want to do is take our unit cell and expand it into the set of planar gratings. So remember there was two parts to this. We took our unit cell and through an FFT, we calculated the Fourier series coefficients. Those are the weights or the amplitudes of the planar gratings. And then each of those planar gratings also had a grading vector associated with it, and we calculated those analytically. So there was two parts to that Fourier series expansion, the weights of the planar gratings and the grading vectors of the planar gratings. But this is a nice little picture of what that looks like. So we expand our unit cell into a set of planar gratings. Next, uh, let's say we have this unit cell, we calculate the FFT. We probably don't want to retain all of the terms that are out here because the weights are almost zero, meaning these planar gratings have almost no effect on making this look like a triangle. So we want to take some window here and just retain those, those Fourier series coefficients or those planar gratings in the expansion. So how do we do that? Well, here's how we're, we're doing the FFT. We start off with ER, which is our unit cell. We'll calculate the FFT, but when we just do the FFT, all of these terms, all the numbers here are pushed off into the corners. And so what we do is an FFT shift, and that puts the numbers in the middle. The next thing is that the FFT is not scaled how we would expect them. And what we need to do is divide by the number of points in the expansion. So clearly we're doing a two-dimensional expansion here. There's only an NX and an NY. If we were Fourier expanding a three-dimensional unit cell, we would have a times NZ in here as well. The next thing we want to do is extract this window from this big set of Fourier series coefficients. So the way I like to do it, we might have a huge grid here. Maybe it's 128 by 128. Could be 1,024 by 1,024. But notice this, the biggest coefficient here. This is the DC component, the zero order component. I want to calculate the array indices of the zero order component right in the center of the grid. That is P naught and Q naught. It's the array indices in the center of this grid that we built the unit cell on. Next, since we want to extract this window, we want to figure out the array indices where the window starts and where it stops. And we want to do that in this Q direction, I'm sorry, in the P direction, and we want to do it in the Q direction, up and down. So we have P1 and P2, that's start and stop, and so it's the center index minus half the number of harmonics. So if we want to retain seven harmonics, if our window here is seven, then we will be subtracting three. And then the stop would be the center array index plus three. And so when we go through this range, we'll come away with seven numbers. And we do the same thing for the vertical direction. 
and then we extract from ERF, this is our Fourier transformed ER, we go from P1 to P2, Q1 to Q2, and I just overwrite ERF here, and now this one is our truncated window. So this is where we'll concentrate. Those are the planar gratings that we retain in the expansion. Well, in fact, those are just the weights of the planar gratings that we're retaining in our expansion. So here's the algorithm for generating a spatially variant lattice. We feed in the unit cell, we do this expansion, and maybe if we retain seven by seven planar gratings, that's a total of 49 planar gratings, we set up a loop and we go through each one of these 49 planar gratings. And for each one, just like we did in the last lecture, we will construct the K function, we will calculate the grading phase on the low resolution grid, interpolate that up to the high resolution grid, um, then we calculate the analog grading, the spatially variant planar grading, and then we take that planar grading and we add it to this overall lattice that we hopefully have initialized it to zero before we enter into this loop. And that's it. So these four steps are the four steps we did in the last module or the last lecture. All we have to do is add them up and then we get our overall spatially variant lattice. Now for each grading, there is something a little bit different. Before we took this map theta and we just set that to the grading vector. Well here we have an expansion of grading vectors. They're all pointing in different directions and we need to retain that, their relative orientations with respect to each other. So rather than set the grading vectors to B theta, we will add theta to whatever angle that grading vector already has. So it's a confusing step, but in fact, it's only a few lines of, of MATLAB code, and we will certainly step through this when we get to that computer session. But let's say we're at grading PQ, and it has a grading vector like this. The first thing I'll do is distribute this across the entire lattice, that same grading vector everywhere, in whatever orientation it came out of inherently. Somewhere we've defined this unit cell orientation, how we want things oriented. Maybe we have rotation matrices. And what we'll do is we'll go point by point and whatever angles being described over here, we will rotate this uniform distribution of grading vectors by these angles. And we might end up with something like this. Now we'll take this and maybe we also want to spatially vary the lattice spacing. So point by point, we will multiply the, the magnitudes of these vectors, but retain their direction, and we'll end up with our final K function. And MATLAB with its polar to Cartesian coordinate and Cartesian back to polar coordinate functions makes this step rather easy. We'll take our grading vector, convert it to polar coordinates, add the theta information, convert it back to Cartesian, and we're done in just two or three lines of code. So now we have this K function, and we want to calculate the grading phase. As we mentioned before, we're doing this with the finite difference method, and given this SVL solve function that we provided with the course, you really don't need to know the numerics behind it. But I'm giving you a taste because this is where, if there is any imperfections, where they come in. So we're solving that del phi equals k. And so we end up having a matrix equation, a times phi equals b, where here's a, and that's our, our derivative operators. This is a banded matrix that calculates a derivative of phi in the x direction. A banded matrix that will calculate the derivative of phi in the y direction. And this kx and ky, these are all the x components of the grading vector stretched out into a big column vector, and all the y components reshaped into a big column vector. So we have an a phi equals b. However, as we mentioned before, we're trying to control two or three things. In two dimensions, we only have two. In three dimensions, we'll have a kx, a ky, and a kz. But we're trying to control two or three things with just one thing. With just a single grading phase, we're trying to control multiple things. That can't be done exactly. We end up solving this by least squares. And again, skipping the derivation of that, in the end, all we do 
is we will pre-multiply A by its transpose, pre-multiply B by A's transpose, and we end up with an A prime and a B prime. And this gives us a new matrix equation that we can solve for the grading phase. And so this SVL solve does that. You just give it the, the two-dimensional pictures of KX and KY, the grid resolution, and it returns back your fee that you could image and look at and, and see if it worked. But we have a little bit more work to do. Once we get that fee, that exists on this low resolution grid, if you recall from the, the previous lecture, we need to interpolate that using the interp2 command to our high resolution grid. So now that we have the grading phase for the PQ index planar grading, we calculate the analog grading from it. So it's the complex exponential of just J times the grading phase we just calculated on the high resolution grid times the weight, and that gives us our analog grading. Then the overall lattice, we add up all of these planar gradings. So again, I like to visualize it something like this. This actually shows all of the different planar gradings spatially varied, and then we add them up, we get this lattice of triangles spatially varied in some, some arbitrary manner. And that is really it. Each of these planar gradings is spatially varied independently and separately. The results of one don't leak into the results of, of any of the others in any way. We just add up the results and we have our lattice in the end. Once we have the analog lattice, uh, a lot of times I'll just extract the real part of that. And in an ideal world, the imaginary component should be close to zero, but just due to some numerical noise, it can be there. So to clean it up, we'll just take the real part of it. So it's purely real, and that's our actual analog lattice. Then we can apply our threshold and spatially vary fill fraction if we want. And if our grayscale unit cell is close to a cosine profile, we can estimate what this threshold needs to be to realize some kind of fill fraction. And this is all done on the high resolution grid as well. So here's the overall algorithm for spatially variant lattices. First, we define all the input stuff. We define the orientation, the lattice spacing, the fill fraction, and we create pictures of how we want to spatially vary these things. Then we'll build our unit cell. It's preferred, if you want to spatially vary fill fraction, it's preferred to do a grayscale unit cell. The next thing the algorithm is to decompose this into a set of planar gratings. Remember, there's two parts to that. We'll FFT our unit cell to get the coefficients or the weights, and then we do this analytical expansion for the grading vectors for each planar grading in the expansion. Then we truncate this, and we can truncate it real easily to a square window. There's some better things we can do we'll talk about later in this lecture, but right now we're just limiting it to a square window with some number of planar gradings. Then we set up a big loop, and we loop through each of the planar gradings that we've retained in our expansion. We construct the K function, we calculate the grading phase, we interpolate that grading phase up to the high resolution grid, then we calculate the analog planar grading, we add that to the overall lattice, and we keep doing that. And in the end, we have this overall grayscale lattice. At that point, we can incorporate a spatially variant fill fraction. And that's it. Now I want to show you very quickly two and a half simple ways of improving the efficiency of the algorithm. And I say that one half because it's really just a combination of the first two techniques. The first technique is to look at our expansion of grading vectors. And it turns out if we have two grading vectors that are parallel, they have different magnitudes, but as long as they're parallel, the grading phase that we calculate is only different by a constant. So it's not necessary to go through the whole numerical procedure of calculating the grading phase for both of those grading vectors. We'll just calculate it for one and then just scale that grading phase to get the grading phase of the other.
So here's how it works. On the left, we have some k1. And we will solve this equation numerically to get phi1, the grading phase, from k1. Now imagine we have some k2. That is a2, or it's a times k1. So it's the same as k1, just different by a constant. And that constant can be a negative number, but it's just a constant. It's a single scalar constant. But what we want to do, or if we didn't think about this, we would have had to solve this numerical equation to get the grading phase from that second grading vector. Well, let's play with the numbers here. Let's, let's drop the k2, and we have del phi2 equals a times k1. Now we can bring the a over to the other side and associate it with phi2. Now we have del, or the gradient, phi2 over a, equals k1. However, this expression in here is something we just found. It's actually phi1. So phi1 equals phi2 over a. So that means if we know phi1, it's just a times phi1, and that will give us phi2. And we can do the same thing if we have a k3, k4, uh, any number of, of grading vectors that are parallel we can do this for. So the way we would implement this, we would have our whole list of grading vectors and we would sort them into families, where each family is composed of all the parallel grading vectors. We solve the grading phase numerically just for the first one, and we construct it for all the others just by scaling it by a constant. Here's a visualization of that. On the left here, I believe, is an 11 by 11 grid window in Fourier. So we're retaining 121 spatial harmonics or planar gratings. If we sorted this into families, we're left with 40 families. And so here are all of the grading vectors that have unique directions. And so we went from 121 down to 40. So that's a pretty significant truncation. So if we go out to many, many, many harmonics, for two-dimensional lattices, we get a pretty consistent 70% reduction in the number of times we have to solve that del phi equals k. For 3D lattices, it's about 60% reduction. So a little bit less for 3D, but still very significant, still worth doing. Here is a second thing that we can do to limit the number of planar gratings in our expansion. So on the upper left, we're showing our unit cell, and we're showing the Fourier series expansion. We can look at the color and get an idea of the amplitude of the Fourier series coefficients. So if we look up here in the corners, we see some cells that are almost white, meaning the amplitude or the magnitude of those Fourier coefficients is almost zero that must mean that they are much less significant than the others and we can probably truncate them. And we come up with some threshold and ignore everything below some threshold. So what I normally like to do is look at my Fourier series coefficients. I will figure out which is the biggest one and I will look at the magnitudes of all the other ones relative to the biggest one. And a good number is usually one or two percent. I get pretty good results from that. I'll retain all of the planar gradings with a Fourier series coefficient that is equal to or greater than two percent of the maximum Fourier series coefficient. So here's an illustration on the lower right of what that's like, what that looks like. So we've X'd off all of these regions and we're only retaining the significant Fourier series coefficients. Now the next thing we can do is both together. So we have our unit cell. We will look at the Fourier series coefficients and eliminate all the insignificant ones. From there, we will look at all the grading vectors associated with those, sort them into families, and only retain the ones that have unique directions. And if we do both of these together, uh, we only have very, very, very few. So we start off with 121 planar gradings and now we're down to, let's see, 5, 10, 11. So that's a huge reduction, and it's very common 
when we retain even more spatial harmonics to resolve that unit cell even sharper, that we can get 98, 99% reduction. So this is a really effective way to um, improve efficiency. Now in the computer sessions, we will implement the truncation by grading amplitude, but we're not going to implement the truncation by coplanar K, because just the way we do the sorting and stuff is just a little bit more than I want to cover here in the short course. If I did do it, then the short course would be called a long course. And the last part of this lecture is sort of a potpourri of different tips and tricks, some of which we've already talked about, but it's nice to have it in writing. The first one is the grid strategy. And even in the last lecture when we were just doing planar gradings, we had this low resolution, high resolution grid strategy. Well, there's really even a third grid at work. When we're spatially varying lattices, we have a grid that we're building our unit cell on. And we're doing an FFT to calculate the Fourier series coefficient. It turns out we need many hundreds of points along each axis to get accurate Fourier series coefficients. So we'll have one grid that's over the span of a single unit cell that may contain 500 or 1,000 points along each axis. But once we calculate the FFT of that and extract our little window and do our truncation, we can throw that grid away. We don't need that anymore. And that grid's only over the area of one unit cell. Then the grids that we've been talking about take over. We have this low resolution grid throughout the entire lattice. It's a rather coarse grid, and we build our period input function on it, our orientation input functions, and we build our K function on it. We solve for grading phase on it, which is the big choke point in this. And then once we have that, once we have this grading phase on the low resolution grid, then we interpolate that up to a high resolution grid. So these two pictures, if we plotted them side by side, if everything's working, we should not be able to tell the difference unless somehow we were distinguishing the number of points, but they should look the same. Then we calculate our analog grading, and then we keep adding all of these analog gradings to get the overall lattice. So when we spatially grade lattices, there's three grids at work one for the unit cell, which, mean, which needs many hundreds of points along each axis. The low resolution grid, and we do all of the numerical, most of the numerical work on it, and then it's when we finally have the grading phase that we step up to this high resolution grid and manipulate the gradings on this high resolution grid. So how do we choose the resolution? Well, on the high resolution grid, we'll just go with many hundreds of points. So maybe 512 by 512 points, something like that. Then on the high resolution, uh, sorry. Let me back up and, and start over. <laughs> on the, the unit cell high resolution grid, a good way to pick the, the resolution is this. We'll take the lattice, the, the lattice spacing, the unit cell spacing, and we divide by the number of planar gradings we want to retain in that particular direction. So if we're retaining a seven by seven grid of planar gradings, this P would be seven. And then we have a number here that's something like 10. So it's the, the period divided by the number of planar gratings and also divided by a number something like 10. And if we do this, it turns out we need a grid that's several hundred points. The next thing, we calculate our low resolution grid. And for that, we look at the period of our lattice and divide by some number like 10. And 10 points per unit cell works pretty good for the lattice. Now our high resolution grid cell is sort of the same equation, but we don't use the lattice spacing of the lattice. What we do is we look at all of our planar gratings in the expansion. We find the one that has the largest magnitude grading vector, and that will correspond to the planar grading with the shortest period, which we're indicating with a min here. So two pi divided by the maximum magnitude k vector, 
gives us the shortest period. We take this shortest period and divide it by a number like 10. And so we'll have 10 points per the shortest period. And so that'll be our resolution on the high resolution grid. That ensures we resolve the highest spatial frequency grading and everything looks nice and crisp. Here's another tip or trick. Suppose we want to spatially vary an array of metallic elements. A lot of times those metallic elements have very fine thin features. And if we expand those into a Fourier series, we end up with many thousands and thousands of terms in order to resolve those thin features accurately. It turns out there's a much better way. And instead what we'll do is just spatially vary two planar gratings that would correspond to the axes of our lattice. And we look at where they intersect. And wherever they intersect, we drop a metallic element down to. And so that's how we would do that. We don't ever have to expand these into thousands of planar gratings. And so this is what it looks like uh, kind of overall. We have this, this big spatially variant lattice. We only did two planar gratings and we placed the elements at the intersection. So we go from here to here with just two planar gratings instead of hundreds or thousands. And then last, not something we'll get into a lot of detail on, but it's of increasing interest to put periodic structures onto curved surfaces. And in this case, even if we did not want to spatially vary the lattice, in order to put it down on a curved surface without deforming it, we have to spatially vary it. And the algorithm we discussed works just fine. The only thing we have to do is modify our, our directions of x and y. We can't keep taking derivatives in x and y directions. And if we look at the upper left, here's a, a surface mesh, if you will. And we have these green and red vectors that you see at the origin of each of these cells. If this mesh were flat, the green and red arrows would point in the x and y directions. But when we curve our surface or form it, they're now pointing in different directions. So we're calculating our gradient in the directions of B and A instead of X and Y. But other than that change, the algorithm works just fine. And so to distribute elements over a two-dimensional surface, we would spatially vary two planar gradings. And we look at them together, look at the intersections, and place elements where the intersections happen. And again, this lets us get away with many, many fewer planar gratings than it would take to actually resolve those thin rings. So that is it for this lecture.